Hello and welcome to the ESHG Award Lecture. This year's ESHG Award goes to Professor Carlos Caldas from the University of Cambridge. Could I have one slide back? Because I briefly want to say something about the ESHG Award itself, if possible. Ah, thank you. So the Thank you very much. Sorry for this technical glitch. There we go. So the ESHG Award, formerly the Mauro Bacciarotto Award, was founded in 1992 and is presented at the European Society of Human Genetics meeting in recognition of individuals in achievement of human genetics. So this year, the award goes to Professor Caldas from the University of Cambridge. Professor Caldas received his medical degree from the University of Lisbon, after which he trained at both the University of Texas Southwestern and Johns Hopkins University Hospital before completing a research fellowship at the University of London. He is now a senior group leader at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. He is chair of cancer medicine at the University of Cambridge. He is an honorary consultant medical oncologist at Edinburgh's Hospital and director of the Cambridge Breast Cancer Research Unit. He is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, fellow of the European Academy of Cancer Sciences, and an EMBO member. He received the 2016 ESMO Hamilton Fairley Award and holds an EFC Advanced Grant. Professor Caldas conducts research on the biology and clinical implications of breast cancer genomics. His laboratory redefines the molecular taxonomy of breast cancer. The Caldas group revealed novel subtypes and causal pathways of breast cancer and showed how it is possible to use functional genomics to predict the trajectories and relapse risk among different breast cancer subtypes. He has redefined breast cancer as a constellation of 10 genomic driver-based subtypes. His group's genetic profiling work has delineated a new role for microRNAs as modulators of the immune response in a subset of breast cancers. In addition, Professor Caldas has co-led seminal studies of the genomic variability underlying triple negative breast cancers and the ways in which estrogen receptors affect genomic activity in primary breast cancers. His group led the studies of breast cancer biomarkers and novel ways to utilize biopsy tissue to overcome chemo resistance. More recently, his laboratory has developed and pioneered the use of patient-derived tumors as a model for breast cancer, in particularly as a preclinical platform for testing responsiveness to different therapeutic interventions. Carla Oliveira, a member of our ESHG Exec Board and Scientific Program Committee, did her PhD in Carlos's group and described him as the reference in her scientific life, both for his drive and honesty as a person and a professional. According to Carla, Carlos is always excited about research, new projects and ideas, and he will always prioritize the good working environment in the laboratory over a bunch of exceptional students competing with each other. He loves his family, Portuguese food, and of course, his football club, Benfica. The ESSG wishes to recognize Professor Carlos Caldas for his pioneering functional genomics research in breast cancer. He and his team have contributed enormously to our understanding of the biology of breast cancer, resulting in better ways to diagnose and treat this debilitating disease. The ESSG Scientific Program Committee considers these contributions to be of major importance to our field of human genetics and beyond. I want to personally congratulate Professor Caldas with the ESHG Award, also on behalf of Professor Mauricio Genuardi and Professor Alex Raymond, and I look forward to your presentation of the ESHG Award Lecture. Professor Carlos, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really happy to be giving this award lecture. I'm, I'm sorry that this is uh, done recorded, uh, but here we are with the pandemic. Uh, I'm really grateful that the European Society of Human Genetics has given me this award, of which I, have, I am, of course, uh, very honored and, and very proud to receive. Um, over the next 30 minutes, what I would like to do is to present to you work uh, done in my lab on molecular stratification, molecular molecular prediction and dynamic monitoring of breast cancer. But before I get to the science, um, I would like to make some acknowledgements. This is a, a, a recent, a relatively recent picture of uh, uh, my lab. 
And it just uh, is there to remind me that uh, I sit here because I have been surrounded by uh, very talented people since my lab opened in 1997. Graduate students, clinical fellows, postdocs, research assistants and technicians, and I am grateful to all of them uh, for their contributions along the years. I'm also uh, very grateful to Cancer Research UK, who has very generously funded research in my lab for uh, over 20 years. Uh, I am also the recipient of a, an advance grant from the European Research Council, who has also supported research in my lab for the past five years. And I want to highlight three colleagues uh, uh, who have been a, a central part of this uh, journey. Uh, Sam Aparicio um, was a colleague in Cambridge and then moved to Vancouver, where he has been for over 12 years, but we've continued to work together. And the Metabrick study uh, was put together by the two of us, and it underpins a lot of the work that I'm going to present to you today. Uh, Raza Ali is a histopathologist and a molecular pathologist and a group leader at my institute in Cambridge. And he did his PhD in my lab and then stayed as an academic clinical lecturer while he completed his training in histopathology. He then went to Switzerland where uh, he did a postdoc for a couple of years before he was recruited back to Cambridge and we continued to collaborate. And then Paul Farrow, who uh, many of you know, is a genetic and clinical epidemiologist and, and Paul and I have continued uh, to collaborate for uh, a little over 20 years now. Uh, breast cancer is stratified using a, a combination of immunohistochemistry and fluorescent in situ hybridization. And uh, this has not changed much over the last 15 years or so, and gene expression arrays add very little to this stratification. And then efforts uh, such as ICGC and TCGA have uh, summarized and, and characterized the, the mutations uh, in genes identified in breast cancer by point mutations. And, and there are only two or three genes that are mutated in 10% or more of cases and a handful mutated in more than 5% uh, of cases. And this is summarized on the right on this panel from Nelly Pulyak in, in Cancer Cell, where she highlights that the large majority of breast cancers are ER positive luminal-like. This can be divided in luminal A and luminal B based on proliferation, then about 12% of breast cancers are HER2 positive, about half of which are ER positive, positive and the other half ER negative, and then 12 to 15% of breast cancers, we call them triple negative, because they are negative for ER, PR, and HER2. And this is the state of affairs today that is familiar to most of you, but it doesn't really reflect current knowledge. If you look at data from TCGA, and this is very nicely put together in a study published a few years ago in Nature Genetics by Chris Sanders' group, the tumors can be classified into M-class, the ones that uh, have their genomic landscapes dominated by point mutations, or C-class, the ones that have their genomic landscapes dominated by copy number aberrations. And really, breast cancer and ovarian cancer have their genomic landscapes dominated not by point mutations, but by copy number aberrations. And indeed, these tumors that have lots of copy number aberrations are precisely the ones that have fewer point mutations. So it is, again, no surprise that it is within genes affected by copy number aberrations that you will find the drivers, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Just combining copy number profiling with gene expression profiling, and this is data here from 1,000 tumors from our original publication in 2012. And in red, we highlight oncogenes, and in blue, tumor suppressor genes. And these are identified by combining cis outlying expression with copy number aberrations. And there, you identify oncogenes such as RB2 and cyclin D that are familiar to you, or new oncogenes such as ZNF703. And likewise, tumor suppressor genes such as P10 or MAP2K4. 
So we hypothesize that by combining copy number and gene expression, and looking in particular for genes whose expression is driven in cis by copy number aberrations, that if we use these genes to cluster breast cancers, we will, would identify how many breast cancer subtypes there are. And this is precisely what I show you here. And the data was really robust that using this approach, we identified 10 breast cancer subtypes. And I'm not gonna go over all 10 subtypes for the sake of time, but I'm just gonna highlight with two groups of tumors that are both estrogen receptor positive, but they are completely different genomic entities. So these tumors here, integrative cluster two, are characterized by amplification of 11Q13 around cycling D and PAC1. Whereas these tumors here in integrative cluster six, also ER positive tumors, they are characterized by an amplification of 8P12 around ZNED F703. So these are completely distinct genomic entities. And indeed, all 10 subtypes are that we call integrative clusters are distinct genomic entities with very characteristic genomic profiles, which I show here. In red, copy number gains, in blue, copy number losses. These are ordered along the chromosomes from chromosome one on the left to chromosome X on the right. And you see that each of the integrative clusters has a particular genomic profile. Now you might ask, how do you know that these are the subtypes that reflect ground truth? Well, we had a further 1,000 tumors, and that is indicated on the right here. And using the classifier that we had identified in the first 1,000, we classified the second 1,000 tumors into the same, same 10 subtypes. And so it's no surprise that their genomic profiles are nearly identical on the left and on the right. But even more important is that the proportion of tumors that were stratified into the 10 subtypes was very similar or nearly identical in the first 1,000 tumors and in the second 1,000 tumors. This was not just an artifact, if you want, of the data in our samples, although it were 2,000 samples and so that was unlikely to be the case, but we looked at the further 7,500 samples that were available at the time this was work done by Raza Ali when he was in my lab, about 40 different studies. And using a classifier to classify the tumors into the 10 integrative clusters, he classified the tumors into each of these studies into the 10 integrative clusters. And as you can see, not only did he identify the 10 subtypes, but when he agglomerated the data, the proportion of tumors classified into the 10 integrative clusters was very similar to what we had originally described in 2012. So these are very robust genomic entities. Not only that, but if you stratify tumors into the integrative clusters and you look at their prognosis, or you look at whether they predict response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the bottom panel, you see that they are highly informative. The Kaplan-Myers curves on the top show the survival of tumors classified into the 10 integrative clusters, actually 11, because we realized later that tumors in integrative cluster four, which are tumors with fewer copy number aberrations, need to be stratified into ER positive and negative because they are very different entities, uh, as you can see here, even by their survival curves. And you identify good prognosis integrative clusters on the top, poor prognosis, uh, uh, ER-positive tumors here. The tumors in purple are the triple negative basal-like from integrative cluster 10, and the tumors in brown are the HER2-positive breast cancers. And this is a very poor prognosis here, reflective of the fact that these tumors were prior to the availability of trastuzumab. And then on the bottom, you see in light blue, indicating the percentage of tumors that go on to have pathological complete response after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And so, for example, it's no surprise that basal-like tumors are much more likely to have PAT-CR versus the ones that are luminal A. So you look on the right at the same tumors classified into the integrative clusters, and you might be wondering, what are these tumors here 
that appear to be all chemoresistant. Well, these tumors are in integrative cluster too. These are these tumors here in light green. So these are very poor prognosis tumors that despite being poor prognosis in luminal B, appear all to be chemoresistance. So added information to what is provided by the PAN50 subtypes. This is also illustrated in terms of prognostication, and I don't have time to go into all of the details. We published this in 2019, and I actually highlight here triple negative breast cancers. And we asked the question, triple negative breast cancers that are relapse free at five years are highly likely to be cured, but they are not all cured. And this is indicated by the green line here. And at 20 years, about 15% of the patients will still relapse. And this is what happens if they are classified as triple negative. Now, if you stratify them into integrative cluster 4 and integrative cluster 10, you see in black the dramatic difference. Whereas in tumors classified as in integrative cluster 10, if they are relapse free at five years, the chance of relapse up to year 20 is less than, is around 5%. The tumors classified as integrative cluster 4, equally triple negative, if they are relapse free at five years, you cannot tell these patients that they are cured because up to 20% of these patients will still relapse up to year 20. Highlighting again the importance of stratifying into the integrative clusters versus the classical in, uh, intrinsic subtypes or, or immunohistochemical subtypes. These tumors have also very distinct copy num uh, uh, mutational profiles. Now, we could not afford at the time to do whole exome sequencing, so we used a gene panel. The genes were very carefully selected, and we only missed a couple that we now, in hindsight, should have included, like estrogen receptor gene and FOXA1. But leaving that aside, these genes were carefully selected, and indeed, we enriched four mutation drivers. And out of the 170 genes that we profiled, 42 met the criteria to be called mutational drivers. And here is the pattern of mutations of these mutational drivers in tumors stratified into the 11 integrative clusters now by separating integrative cluster 4 into ER positive and negative. And you see that they have very distinct mutational profiles. And I highlight this is with one gene uh, for the sake of this audience, which is BRCA1. And BRCA1 germline mostly, and the few som somatic mutations that we identified, concentrate on tumors classified as triple negative basal-like in integrative cluster 10. Now, this data also allows us to ask a question about intratumor heterogeneity, and I'm not going to show you the details, also immune response, and to come up with this observation that intratumor heterogeneity and immune response are significantly different across the genomic subtype. So, uh, you know, here is data summarized for 2,500 cases. The circle sizes that you see are proportional to the number of cases in that subtype, in that integrative cluster. And on this axis, we, in, uh, 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 we, we, we summarize the median fraction of genome altered. So this is using copy number data. And on this other axis, we use a, a, a mathematical score of intratumor heter heterogeneity called the MAT score. And you see that tumors that are triple negative highly genomically unstable, basal-like, they have lots of copy number aberrations and a lot of intratumor heterogeneity. And then there is a group of tumors here, which are mostly the ER-positive, good prognosis uh, uh, integrative clusters, where tumors have fewer copy number aberrations and lesser intratumor heterogeneity, and then tumors here that, that are intermediate, including, for example, the HER2-positive tumors. But I now would like to highlight one particular group of tumors, these tumors here. These tumors are triple negative, like tumors in integrative cluster 10. They are also P53 mutant. They characterize by high levels of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And these tumors have fewer copy number aberrations and lesser intertumor heterogeneity, despite having similar mutational burden to tumors in integrative cluster 10, suggesting that these tumors are immunoedited by the lymphocytes that infiltrate them. We now can study copy number aberration intratumor heterogeneity at the single cell level, and this is what I highlight here. I show on the left a tumor from integrative cluster 10, and on the right a tumor for integrative cluster 2. Each column is one cell, 
and we look at the copy number aberrations at the single cell level, and you see that tumors in integrative cluster 2 are tumors that have very little genomic heterogeneity. Really, we can only identify two subclones. All cells have the characteristic 11Q13 amplicon, and then about half of the cells have this deletion on the telomere of chromosome 1P that separate them from the rest of the cell. So two clones. Contrast that with this tumor from integrative cluster 10, where there is you know, a lot of clonal heterogeneity. You know, if, if you look carefully, most of the cells are different from the other cells, suggesting a high level of genomic instability. We now can do a similar analysis at, at the level of, you know, if you want cellular intratumor heterogeneity, and also look at tissue architecture using recently available technology like imaging mass cytometry. Think of imaging mass cytometry uh, if you want, as a combination of immunohistochemistry with, uh, uh, you know, uh, mass spectro uh, spectros uh, mass uh, uh, spectroscopy. So, so uh, basically, uh, um, you you label antibodies with a heavy lanthanide metal and you use time of flight mass uh, uh, spectroscopy to to classify. Uh, each pixel, and then you combine this information to classify cells into cellular phenotypes. And you can do this uh, in, in the cell autonomous compartments of the malignant cells, and also in the tumor microenvironment, lymphocytes, macrophages, fibroblasts, and so forth. And we identify these cellular phenotypes, and then you can ask the question as what is the prevalence of these cellular phenotypes in tumors from Metabric that they have been classified into the different integrative clusters. And this is what is shown here. Here you see tumors classified into each of the integrative clusters, and then highlighted are the cell types that are particularly over or underrepresented in that subtype compared with all other subtypes. And as you can see, each of the integrative clusters has a distinct tumor microenvironment. And it's suggesting that the genomic subtype instructs the tumor microenvironment. And so, if you want, we can conceptualize the integrative clusters as, as, as forests of similar genomic trees. So here are just three types of forests, of bobo trees, olive trees, and pine trees. And just think of these as the integrative clusters. The trunk of the tree is the genomic aberration that, that characterizes that subtype. And then, you know, there will be trees that grow more than others with more or less branches. The tumor microenvironment is the soil and the atmosphere. And so you can start seeing that an olive tree does not get transformed into a pine tree and vice versa. The tumors maintain their genomic characteristics, but might have different degrees of, if you want, uh, genomic phenotypes and actually cellular phenotypes. So, Integrative clustering of breast cancer is stratification of breast cancers into genomic and, as I showed you, tumor microenvironment subtypes. These are ecosystems that have distinct evolving clonal and cellular architectures in both space and time, and so this will affect metastases, it will affect response to therapy, and so forth, and it leads to the discovery of new biological, clinical, and treatment paradigms, which I put to you will transform the management of patients. Now, you know, this is all fine, but we then intervene therapeutically. And so what is the, if you want, the trialogue between the cancer cell, the tumor microenvironment, and therapy? And we can study this in breast cancer in the neoadjuvant setting. In the neoadjuvant setting, you get a biopsy to establish the diagnosis, then you start chemotherapy, and then you get surgery at the end. And so you can objectively tell whether a tumor is sensitive or resistant to chemotherapy. You can either do, also do biopsies in the middle of therapy. So you can ask what happens to the tumor while it's still in situ as it is perturbed by chemotherapy. Now, the baseline characteristics of the tumor will determine to a great degree whether the tumor is going to respond or not. So tumors with more mutations are more likely to have pathological complete response indicated in green here. Tumors that, that are predicted to have more neoantigens are more likely to have pathological complete response. P53 mutations predict sensitivity to chemotherapy, whereas PIK3C mutations predict resistance. 
mutational signatures can predict response to chemotherapy. And then how the tumor microenvironment is shaped. In this case, tumors that are more proliferative and with more immune infiltration are the ones more likely to go on to have PAD-CR. This is in the pretreatment biopsy. But now we have this added biopsy in the middle, and so we can ask a dynamic question. What happens to a tumor that is being perturbed by chemotherapy? And for example, we can look at clonal dynamics. And tumors that, are, that have unstable clonal dynamics, so they have em emerging clones and other clones that are suppressed by chemotherapy, these tumors are more likely to be chemoresistant. Or tumors that have more lymphocytic infiltration and more inflammation as they receive chemotherapy, they're more likely to go on to have pathological lead response. And even more interesting, and this is very preliminary data, but very exciting, is that this is T cell receptor genotypes. And tumors that go on to have PAD-CR are more likely to have oligoclonal expansion of CD3R uh, clonotypes than tumors that are resistant and are less likely to have oligoclonal expansion of T cells. Now, liquid biopsies can be used to monitor these dynamics. This is just one example of work that we uh, contribute to, to, led by Muhammad Murtaza, that used to be in Cambridge and is now in the United States. We're using liquid biopsies to look at circulating tumor DNA. We can measure these dynamics and see that tumors that go on to have PAD-CR are more likely to have a drop in their circulating tumor DNA levels. So this ability to monitor dynamically and the fact that we conceptualize tumors in integrative clusters as belonging of forests with similar trees led us to this concept of what I call anticipatory genomics. And, and I just want to give you one example here of one patient. This patient had a primary tumor, then he had a metastasis, she had a metastasis with a biopsy in the supraclavicular fossa leaf node, then another metastasis of a year or two later in the axilla, and then a, a, a different metastasis in her breast uh, uh, three years later. And indicated in red are the liquid biopsies that we obtained in this patient so we could measure circulating tumor DNA. And in actually one of these biopsies, we were able to get enough uh, live tissue that we could establish a xenograft. So now we have a xenograft from one of the metastases in this patient. And we can ask the question, when we serially passage the xenograft, which is indicated here, what are the clonal dynamics? In other words, is there any clonal evolution here? Are there any copy number gains or losses that appear or disappear? And then we can ask along the history of the tumor. So this is the primary tumor here, and these are four consecutive visits the patient had where we got circulating tumor DNA. And look at this, it's quite remarkable. On visit 15, which is late visit uh, uh, when the patient had lots of metastases, you see lots of copy number aberrations can be identified in circulating tumor DNA. They're very similar to the ones that we identify in the xenograph that was obtained uh, a year before uh, the patient eventually died of metastatic disease. So this is the concept of anticipatory genomics, is can you use xenografts and liquid biopsies to predict how a given tumor is going to evolve as a result of just spontaneous clonal evolution or selective pressures such as the ones exerted by chemotherapy. And so I would like to finish on that note and to summarize by saying that breast cancer, I hope to have convinced you, is a constellation of 11 different diseases with distinct copy number aberration drivers, prototypical point mutational landscapes, prototypical tumor microenvironment landscapes, that clonal heterogeneity is one of the features, the type of clonal heterogeneity that you identify is one of the features of each of the integrative clusters and that they also have very distinct clinical courses. And here is a summary of the, you know, key papers over the last uh, 10 years that summarize this work. And again, I want to uh, finish by uh, again saying that I am really deeply honored to uh, receive this distinction and that uh, uh, I hope 
the uh, lecture that I have just given you highlights the work that probably uh, uh, was the reason why the society decided to give me this award. And I want to thank you all uh, for your attention. So much, Professor Carlos Caldas, for this fantastic presentation. And of course, it's nice to see you here and congratulate you with the ESG Award uh, personally. Um, can I ask, as a, before we go to the scientific questions, can I ask, did you receive our ESG Award luck at home or not? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, you know, thank you so much. Uh, it will it will be on the roster in my office at the university. So I'm I'm delighted. It's, it's a very nice, very nice memento. Thank you so much. Pleasure, and it's uh, it's really a pity we can't give it in person and and have you in front of an audience of a, a few thousand people. But that's that's where we are. We are very happy to have this online meeting, of course. Um, Okay, let me then move to the questions. There is a, uh, there is no question uh, yet. So I think we have to ask colleagues uh, to come up with questions. Um, I'll, I'll first start with Professor Genuardi, who has a question. Yeah, thanks. Very very much. Thanks very much and congratulations uh, for the excellent talk. Uh, you mentioned that uh, a TP53 is a predictor of uh, a, a good response to chemotherapy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, it is associated with TMBC, which is uh, a cancer that has, uh, uh, in general, a worse prognosis. How can you reconcile these apparently contradictory findings? Well, thank you for that question. This is something that sometimes puzzles audiences, because you are absolutely correct. Tumors that have P53 mutations, be it ER negative, which is the majority, but also ER positive, the P53 mutation confers a worse prognosis. But it is also a predictor of response to chemotherapy. And why is that? I think for two reasons, two tumors that have P53 mutations are more likely to be proliferative, so more sensitive to chemotherapy. The second reason is that P53 is a guardian of the genome of, uh, you know, checkpoints. And if you don't have the checkpoint there and then you hit cells with chemotherapy, they more likely, if you want, you know, I don't want to call it synthetic lethality, but it's effectively a functional equivalent of synthetic lethality. The fact that they have a P53 mutation, no checkpoint, the cells can progress to mitotic catastrophe, for example, and if you expose them to chemotherapy. There's a third reason, which is the interaction with the immune system. This is poorly studied and you need large numbers or functional studies that are difficult to do, but it looks like a tumor cell that has a P53 mutation, probably because of the existence in the cytoplasm of DNA with double strand breaks and so forth, that they will activate uh, an immune response through, uh, you know, pathways of uh, immunogenic cell death and, and, and others. And the interaction between the existence of, of cell-free DNA, of, of not, not cell-free DNA, cytoplasmic DNA with DNA damage, and that, you know, inducing damps and other things that will then have a dialogue with the immune system. So, so it's a complex uh, thing, but yes, tumors with P53 mutations are more likely to respond to chemotherapy. Okay, thank you. I'll go on to a number of questions which are now coming in on the chat. So the first one from Ines Zuter. Can an evolving small cancer be detected by liquid biopsies? <laughs> okay, uh, that's, uh, that's a question that I get very often. So I'll, I'll give you an answer in two parts. You know, clearly, if you have a diagnosed tumor, and if you have in your hand, if you want the genome of that tumor, you now have a barcode that you can follow and you can design very sensitive assays to look for that barcode that is unique to that tumor and use it for tumor monitoring, either in the context of metastatic disease and looking at tumor burden versus benefit of therapy, or in the curative context where you resect the tumor 
or give it neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you have that barcode and you then look for relapse. And there, there is a lot of promise. Uh, and the work of my group and all the groups has clearly shown that. Now, what you're asking is a bit different, which is in a woman in the population for which we have no tumor biopsy at all, can we use circulating tumor DNA as an early diagnosis tool? And the answer, the short answer is in theory, yes, that is possible. The practical answer is that although that is possible, that is extremely difficult to do at the moment because you, you need to think about the needle in the haystack problem. And moreover, you don't even know how the needle looks like. So, so, so it is very difficult to design. And now, having said that, there is data with DNA methylation modification. So where you, you methylate uh, uh, cytosine residues and you can detect them. Uh, using, uh, you know, technologies such as bisulfite sequencing or even antibodies to immunoprecipitate the methylated residues, whether there are methylation signatures that are diagnostic. So it is a field of great interest, uh, uh, and, and, and people will uh, 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 certainly, uh, my group and all the groups have invested a lot in this, but we need to wait for the result of, of trials, and, and this is going to take time. Okay, fantastic. Um, then we'll um, move on. I saw a question actually from Carla Oliveira herself. Thanks for this inspiring lecture. How long do you think it will take to bring these data into everyday clinical practice? Well, uh, that's again a, a very interesting question. Um, we, <laughs> maybe naively, myself and Sam, decided when we started the Metabric study, that it would be run by with the Bermuda principles. In other words, we would generate the data, not file any patents on it, and make the data available to the community. And I'm delighted to say that the raw data has been downloaded by literally hundreds of groups. The uh, um, EGA at EBI did a piece on it a few months ago. It's, it's the data set that is most accessed, uh, or one of the most accessed data sets that they have. And there are literally, you know, thousands of, of publications that have used the data in its processed form. So, um, you know, that created a difficulty because since we did not have a patent for the integrative clusters, the appetite of diagnostics companies to take over this and, and, and design a test, as you can imagine, is, is not very high. Uh, and, and the diagnostics market is a difficult one. Now, we're trying to design an academic test that could be used in paraffin embedded material. We have struggled with it a bit because it's difficult to design diagnostic tests using paraffin embedded material. And we are not a company, we are an academic lab, but we're persevering. And as soon as we have a panel that can use DNA extracted from paraffin embedded material, we'll make it again available to everyone to use. Yeah. Thank you. Um, then I'm going to the next question. From Nicoline Hogebrugge, what a super lecture. Do you foresee that this type of, cancer, of tumor calcification will find its way into diagnostics in the clinic? Well, we basically talked about this. So um, a question, a follow-up question from Ines Zuters. She asked whether early cancer is distinct from later stage disease. It's a very mm. general question. I don't know if you want to answer that. Yes. So that is a very interesting question. I don't want to preempt unpublished work, but you know, I, people have heard me talk about this before, so it's no trade secret. <laughs> if you look at DCIS associated with invasive tumors classified into the integrative clusters, you will not be surprised to hear that the DCIS at the copy number level, you can see there the truncal lesions that you then see in, in the invasive tumor. So I think these remain, as I use the image of the forests of similar trees, they remain, you know, the tumor cells, all tumor cells will have the truncal copy number aberrations that define the integrative cluster. So they don't move from one to the other. Now there might be tumors where there is more than one clone and one dominates in one time of the natural history of the tumor and then later at the real, but that is the exception, not the rule. We and others have looked, we, you probably saw our paper with an autopsy series of a limited number of cases, but lots of biopsies 
uh, more than 100 in 10 patients uh, that, that, you know, the, the integrative clusters stay. So these are like the tree. Now, how the tree then evolves, there is, I think, some canalization of the possible evolution. That's the concept of anticipatory genomics. And, 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 and so we, we think that eventually there will be a rule book, like uh, Charlie Swanton talks about, the rule book of, of, of tumors, uh, that, that we will be able to predict with a certain degree of certainty how a particular tumor is going to evolve and how clones are going to be selected by therapy and by the immune response and so forth. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much. There is a number of additional questions coming in now, but we have to close in a few moments. Um, one question from Joaquin Makeda. Fascinating work. Thank you for your presentation. Do you believe these genome-driven integrated clusters can be applied in hereditary breast cancer? Well, so, as I indicated with BRCA1, there are, it's just, that's one example. But what I think is going to be needed and, you know, I'm, I've got to be cautious here because I'm talking to an audience of, of geneticists. But a lot of people have criti criticized unfairly genome association studies. And, you know, work of Paul Farrow, Doug Easton, and others has clearly shown the value of, of association studies to identify predisposition alleles. I'm not going to tell that they are predisposition genes in the classical sense of BRCA1 and BRCA2. And so my prediction is that you really need to do an association study for each of the 11 integrative clusters, uh, because I think that there will be nuances of the genetic deck of cards that you handed at birth that will predict, you know, you will be more predisposed to have a cancer of one of the integrative clusters. So that, that is fascinating, and it's you need to phenotype these tumors. You know, you guys are geneticists, so you, this is no foreign to you. If you don't have a very good phenotype, and so these are 11 different phenotypes. And so if you mix phenotypes, you're going to have a hard time identifying the predisposition alleles. And so that is, the proof of principle of that is with PR positive versus negative. But I just showed you that the ER positives are extremely heterogeneous, you know, and so are the ER, ER negative. So you need to do an association study for each of the integrative clusters, I would say. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Caldas. There are more questions, but we have to move to our next and final uh, award session. So, again, congratulations with the ESHG award on behalf of, of, of everybody here at the ESHG. And um, we hope to see you in person at one of our next conferences. Thank you so much. I'm very honored. Thank you. And we now go to our last session and we have to go to the next link. So see you all.